Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Holy Smoke Cigars and Spirituality. This is Christian A. Smith, the host and the heretic. So glad that you're here. As we continue our Christian cancel culture series, this time we're talking about probably the most divisive topic in the country right now, critical race theory. Boy, this is going to be an interesting discussion today. We had no idea when we planned the season that this episode would be so necessary at this time because so much has developed over the past six or seven weeks as it pertains to critical race theory. Um, so uh, that's what we're going to do today. I'm excited about the cast that we have. We got some of my favorite people here and I love everybody on the cast. I just don't get to see this lineup, you know, frequently. So to have this lineup is really cool. Uh, we're going to get into that in just a moment. We'll do our introductions. But first, before we get into our introductions, we got to give y'all the one rule of Holy Smokes. And I'm going to kick that over to Myra the Mystic today to give us the one rule. Folks, welcome to Holy Smokes. As you know, we have got one rule. Everybody's got a theory. Everybody's got an idea. But here at Holy Smokes, the one rule is that we honor each other's lived experience. We don't uplate theories or other people's wait, ideas. Wait, Doc. Wait, Doc. You got to say it again. I just can't rush past it. No, you can't rush past Holy it. Smokes. The yeah. one rule is that we honor each other's lived experiences. Okay, one more time. One more, one more time. time. All right, we're going to do it. The one rule is that we honor each other's lived experiences. We don't uplift theories over what people have actually lived. Uh, and, you know, we welcome healthy debate, but we honor each other's lived experience. That's based in this idea called the greatest commandment theology, which has been curated uh, by the father of the Holy Smokes movement himself, Mr. Christian A. Smith. And this is what it says. It says, our love for God is displayed <laughs> about through how you love your neighbor which is an extension of how you love yourself. Therefore, you can't love God if you don't love your neighbor. And you can't love your neighbor if you don't love yourself. Uh, and he wrote a great book about this. And I don't know if you, uh, I don't know if we pitch the book very often on here, but you need to get a copy of Breaking All the Rules uh, at ChristianASmith.com. He didn't ask me to do this, uh, but get the book. My favorite chapter is chapter four. Chapter four is, is probably the most pivotal chapter in the book. I mean, all of it's good. Uh, but when you read the first page of chapter four, you're going to realize, man, this book is powerful. <laughs> he's no, only to you. He's only saying that because he's in chapter four. His name I is am. on the first page of chapter I am. four. That's the only reason. It was relevant for me in that moment. I said, well, I'm, damn, that's me. The book was speaking to me. <laughs> and honestly, to me, chapter four is the most pivotal chapter of the book. <laughs> See? Not not because Myron is in that chapter. But... One of the reasons. <laughs> okay. It's not the only reason. Okay, it's one of the reasons. It's one of the reasons. Okay, got it, got it, got it. All right. So um for those who are listening to this podcast and, and won't get a chance to see it, let me give you one reason why you should join us on Patreon. Because when you watch the episodes, you get to see stuff like Myron's frames that he's wearing today. This Somebody man. Y'all are too kind to take this hat off so you can see. I bought them online, so I want y'all to take a look at this. Let me zoom into him. Look at that. Don't you see that? Cool? I've never seen frames like that. I said, let me get these. You there wear them well. Thank you. Not Thank many you. people could wear them, Myron. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. I appreciate that. I got a vote of confidence here from the whole yeah, They're matching your shirt. They're matching the plaid squares yeah. on the Thank you. Now. I'm telling you, you're killing the game. Listen, you oh got to sign up for Patreon. You are gassing me up here, y'all. You got to sign up for Patreon, y'all. This, this is the reason you got to join us on Patreon. We ain't here with the live virtual audience. We got Austin, Ariana, we got Kirkland, Pamela, Isha. We got some other people here who I haven't even seen yet. Listen, you got to come join us on Patreon. That's patreon.com backslash TFCATL. Join us for the live virtual recordings and other you know wonderful benefits. But listen, we're going to keep going because we got to get into this critical race theory conversation. So let's start with some introductions today for introductions. Tell us what you're smoking and or drinking, if anything, because um, smoking and drinking is optional here. We we well, I'm sorry. 
Um, Karima said, drinking is not optional. <laughs> but uh, we encourage people, if you're going to smoke or drink, do it in moderation, everything in moderation. We're not promoting drunkenness. Uh, but if you're smoking and or drinking, tell us what are you having? And then also, by way of introduction today, share something you've learned about race that you wish you would have been taught in school. And for those who think real deep and like Ariana and say, I wouldn't want my school to teach me anything because I don't trust the system. Imagine you went to the genius school founded by Kareem of the truth. Had you gone to the genius school, what would you have wanted the genius school to teach you about race that you never learned in school? So today we're going to start with the introductions. We're going to go uh, Karima and then Nikki and Myra and I'll finish it out. So Karima, introduce yourself. Well, hello, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whatever time in your life that you happen to stumble upon this here wonderful gathering of souls. My name is Karima Akila. That's what my mom and daddy call me. Tonight, I am sipping on some of the children's juicy juice. Um, yes, it is some apple juice, juicy juice with a little bit of tequila. More so tequila with a little bit of apple juice and a splash of lemon. So what I wish that schools had taught me about race was I really wish that I learned all of the far-reaching systemic results of what happened here in the United States. I am the first person from the line of my mother not to pick cotton and tobacco. And I wish that school had really helped me to understand why is that so? I understood about the Harriet Tubman's of the world and I understood, you know, the slavery and I got that and what now the Martin Luther of the Kings and the Rosa Parks and such. But what I didn't get was what does that mean for me? Me, little black girl in Philly, first little girl out of the line of my mother's, my mother, grandmother, great grandmother, and so on, picked cotton and tobacco as sharecroppers, and then they picked it as slaves, and then somebody was on a boat brought here from Africa all the way to me. So I wish that I understood systemic racism and its long lasting effects. Thank you for sharing that. You know what's funny about this conversation? some people don't even believe systemic racism exists so it's, it's so what's so interesting about this discussion like you answered that question with the basic assumption that systemic racism exists but like we can't even find common ground on that with some people they, they think systemic racism is made up it's so infuriating okay let's keep it going nikki please anchor us Hey everybody, it's so good to be here with you uh, tonight. Um, it is a comfortable June night, so I am outside and I am smoking a Holy S Smokes cigar. This is the Connecticut, right? Am I right about that, Christian? The yes, lighter one is Connecticut. The, that's the Connecticut. Yes, yes. ma'am. Mm -hmm. It's and I think it's probably my favorite of the ones that you all send. I, I enjoy this one a lot. I'm sipping on some Larceny. Um, I was turned on to that by Christian. Thank you very much. And um, what do I wish I had been taught in school about race? Um, I think I wish I had learned about the concept of privilege. Um, I grew up kind of understanding, like my parents always told me, oh, you're fortunate. We take care of you. You have a roof over your head. You have loving parents. Like I understood that I was born into a virtually healthy, you know, middle-class family. Um, and so I understood that I was fortunate. I didn't understand privilege and I didn't understand that there was all this privilege that I, um, that I benefited from and couldn't even see. And so I think that if I, I wish that I had learned that at a younger age. That's awesome. That's awesome. We need more people like you, Nikki. <laughs> we need more people like you. Absolutely. Before I go to Myron, I just got to point out some of the people in the live virtual audience are sharing their feedback. Kirkland, big sexy. One of our producers is also in the virtual audience. I just want you to know Kirkland is one of the top 10 sexiest 
big and tall models in the country, according to Curvy Fashionista. Shout out Kirkland, big, sexy. Check out XL Tribe, XL Shoots. That dude is amazing. Kirkland said, can we talk about how race is woven into everything, like even while we call it a master bedroom? Ever thought about that? Uh, what else do we have? Isha said she wished we would, she would learn who we were before slavery. Kirkland said how we lived before slavery. Ariana said she wants to know, uh, she wish she would have learned how and why race was constructed. So here are some things that are that are coming out from the virtual audience right now that will hopefully uh we'll hopefully take a look at. Let's kick it over to Myron the Mystic. Hey, you folks, Myron? I'm excited to be with y'all again. This is probably a um a, a critical conversation. You get a critical critical race theory. I did that for Grayson. It wasn't Fantastic. as good as Grayson's it, but I mean, we did it. We did it. it no it, it didn't deserve that. It wasn't as good as a Grayson pun. It really wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you what I'm sweating drinking. I'm drinking a, a iced Cafe Royale, right, in honor of the Kingmaker who's in revival tonight. Uh, and then I am smoking the Holy Smokes uh, monthly stick that comes to you if you are part of the Cigar Club on Patreon. This is a Cuban sandwich, I believe. And this is probably one of my favorite cigars uh, so I am smoking that tonight. Uh, and to answer the question, I think what I wish I was taught was the difference between equity and equality. We have always been told we want equality. We want equality. But equality is only good if everybody started from the same position in the same place. Uh, in the words of Anita Baker, that sometimes the scales are unbalanced. Uh, and folks in America, the scales have been unbalanced so long that when we balance the scales, people who've had more weight think it's an attack against them. Uh, and so we need to sometimes take a look at what equity looks like as opposed to equality. Here it is. If you look at the average net worth of African-Americans in America, it's about $36,000. If you look at the average net worth of Caucasian-Americans, it's about $150,000. Why is that unequal? Because the scales have been unbalanced. If you go to Philadelphia, it's even worse. The average net worth of African-Americans in the city of Philadelphia is $8 to the $76,000 of Caucasian Americans in Philadelphia. The scales are unbalanced. So what's the difference between equality and equity? One thing about that Myron Randall, he's gonna be prepared. I read the emails, people. It's the biggest lesson of my life. Read the emails. I'm yes. never letting it go. I'm never letting it go. Myron reads the emails. Thank you, Myron, for consistently reading the emails. Because I never want the wrath of Christian Smith. <laughs> I, that's what it is. Okay, folks? You don't know how I felt in that moment. I was, it was, I was shrunk down into a little bitty ball. I want to cry on the couch in a cigar lounge when Christian said, read the emails. And so from now on, I read the emails. That's so unnecessary. I... I <sighs> Hey, man, all I can do is say, I can't say anything. Like, Thank God for the bearded sage who said, all right now, Christian. It would have been a lot worse. It would have been a lot worse if, if Greg didn't cut him off yeah. at the past. He said, he he said all clear. right, Christian. All right. <laughs> all right, Christian. I was like, oh, am I am I upset? Let me, let me pull it back in. Okay. Uh, all right. So again, I'm Christian. I'm the host. I'm the heretic. I am smoking a new stick today. Uh, Partagas. I've never had this one and I am enjoying it immensely. I went to a cigar lounge last week. A colleague of mine was having a gathering of uh, some gentlemen and he called it the Holy Smokers. Uh, and he invited me to come be a part of it. So I, I went out there and I didn't see anything in the humidor that really jumped out at me that I was familiar with. So I said, let me just get something brand new. And I'm enjoying this Partagas. See if I can get it. No, it's not going to. Well, you know, you can see the label there anyway. Um, and I'm, I'm having a drink that Myron introduced to me. It's called Stolen X or 10. I'm not sure. So basically, this is an old fashioned in a bottle. An old fashioned in a bottle. And I like really 
really like cherries. So like I have a lot of cherries in mine. So that's what I'm smoking. That's what I'm drinking. Um, and what I wish I would have learned about racism in school, I wish I would have learned about racism more as a present reality than a past experience. When I learned about racism in school, I learned about it in the past, but no one ever told me how it functions in the present. So now as an adult and raising my consciousness to see what's happening around me, it forced me to look back at the time I was in grade school and see how I was impacted by racism. So there were a number of experiences I had as a child that were deeply ingrained with racism, but at the time I couldn't explain it. Stuff was just happening to me and I didn't know why. I couldn't explain it because nobody ever taught me in school that racism still happens now. It's a present reality, but it was taught as if this is something that happened in the past and then we had the Civil Rights Act and now we don't deal with it anymore. So that's what I wish I would have learned in school. Yeah. So let's keep it going. Smith, that was so good. And I'm, I know I'm jumping the agenda here. I saw something on uh, one of the social media sites that said that when Harriet Tugman was born, Thomas Jefferson was alive. And when Harriet Tugman died, Ronald Reagan was alive. And then they asked, were you born when Ronald Reagan was president? Right. That shows that it really wasn't that long ago. It was in the span of not even three generations. So, yeah, it's a pressing and present reality. So I think you were right on there, man. Absolutely. Right on. That was that was profound. Absolutely. Uh, if you if you look at black people's presence in this country beginning at 1619, you know, thinking about the 1619 project, critical race theory, we were subjected to slavery and Jim Crow for 350 years. It's only been 50 plus years that we haven't been directly subjected to slavery and Jim Crow, unless you consider the prison population because they're still subjected to slavery, right? That's the loophole in the 13th Amendment. But like we, we, we forget like over the grand scheme of history, which a lot of people just want to ignore, black people in this country have only been somewhat free from slavery and Jim Crow for 50 years. And that just gets thrown out of the conversation too frequently. But my listen, mom gonna... is 65 and she integrated my high school. So you're right on, okay? Yes, yes. I, I shared with my son that I met, um, that I got to meet and talk to the a student that integrated Mercer. And I thought I had been doing a good job of teaching my son about all of this stuff. And he went, like, he's still alive? Like, he, yes. it, it clicked for him, like, I didn't think I'd ever meet anybody who lived this, right? And, and it, like, he was surprised. And I thought, You're right. yes, yes, it, now. This is happening now. So. Yes, absolutely. My mom um, was in grade school during integration. And she's told me how integration impacted her education mm -hmm. and the way integration was carried out. It actually lowered the quality of her education because they took the best black teachers from her school, sent them to the white school, took the lowest performing white teachers from the white school and sent them to the predominantly black school. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, racism in this country is so insidious. It's so insidious. Um, shout out to Dewan, who's with us as well. Uh, let's let's keep it going. But see, I told you it's going to be hard to like try to hone in this conversation. But we're going to keep going. But first, this is Holy Smokes Cigars and Spirituality. So we got to give you all the cigar tip. And today I'm so excited because Nikki, the anchor is here and she is going to give us the anchors cigar advice. Give her her music, please. Hey, 
Hey, everybody. I'm so glad to be um, to take a few moments to share with you a little bit about um, cigar smoking and how I enjoy it. Um, I am a minister at heart. There's so many things that I love about being a minister, but one of the things I love the most is helping to carry out the rituals of the church. And so part of what I really love about cigar smoking is the ritual that surrounds it. Um, every time you choose to sit down and enjoy a stick, you go through um, different steps. You're going to take time to choose your cigar. You're going to smell your cigar. You're going to cl cut your cigar and you're going to find the way that you like to cut it, whether it's um, a poke or just a clean cut or there's an angled cut. Um, e cut. An E cut. Thank you. V, uh, v cut. V cut. Yes. Thank you. See, see, um, as a, as a big, I'm, I still count myself as a beginner in this group. I've been doing it, you know, smoking cigars for a while, but in this group, I'm still a beginner. So I'm grateful to my friends who helped me out. Um, and then you're going to take time to light your cigar and you're going to find the way that you enjoy the smoke. You will, you may take long drags, you may take slow, um, shorter drags, you may um, light your cigar more often than your neighbor, um, but how you do it becomes a pattern and a ritual that, um, that goes from beginning to end of smoking the cigar. And you'll find that um, the, the tools that come with it too are a part of that. Um, there are different tools that you can have to enhance the experience. Um, you'll decide whether you use matches or whether you want to use a lighter like this. Um, but have it, that's part of what I really enjoy um, about this whole uh, ethos of cigar smoking. So that's the Anchors of Cigar Advice for you today. Hey. <laughs> he, he got you for ethos. Ethos. Um, <laughs> culture. The everything around it. He got you. That he, was he good. Totally got me. I liked it. <laughs> that timing was immaculate. It was yes. <laughs> Absolutely. That's 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 so true. It's a whole experience, you know. My my wife Pamela has been getting into cigars recently, and uh, the last time she smoked a cigar, she decided to light it with a match, and she really enjoyed that whole process. So yeah, you know, yeah. it's a whole experience. You got to get into it. Experiment. Yes, yes. Find out what suits you. I learned I really like these lighters. Yes. Um, I cannot, I can't light a cigar evenly with a match. I just have not figured out how to do it. So I really like this because it helps me get an even light because I had a problem at the beginning where like half of my cigar would get smoked down and it would kind of look like a fingernail. <laughs> <laughs> and so That's then Myron introduced me to the butane lighter and it has changed my experience completely. It is. So when your when your cigar looks like a fingernail, that's the first time I heard that one. It's called canoeing. Yeah, that's what it's that, that's the, yep, the that's technical right. term. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Nikki. You're always awesome. We love the anchor cigar advice. All right, so we're talking about Christian cancel culture. We introduced it on the last episode about how Christianity too frequently uh, tries to cancel certain aspects of culture that don't align with Christianity's worldview. Uh, so we started with language, had a great episode last week with a totally different group. We had the Kingmaker, we had AT&T, we had Grace and the Pundit who were here with us talking about language. Today we're talking about how Christian cancel culture is applying itself to critical race theory. So you might be saying, what is critical race theory? It's interesting. It's not birthed out of um, the theological world. Critical race theory is birthed out of the legal world, legal scholars, legal academics, starting in the 70s, actually. This is not a new concept. Starting in the 70s, legal scholars were examining and looking critically at the impact the Civil Rights Act had on racial disparities in the country and they discovered that really nothing had changed the only thing that had really changed was that 
racism became politically incorrect and the disparities remained so that you couldn't explicitly say you were racist you had to find different ways to discriminate based on race and that has continued as myron just shared a moment ago um, the wealth gap has not shifted at all and you know some people will argue that's because you know black people are in their own way or for some reason black people can't come up because we're you know we're shooting ourselves in the foot Maybe we'll get into that later. I don't know. Uh, but the critical race theory concept was to challenge us to view race through, in the words of the kingmaker, a certain lens. <laughs> uh, so um, it helps us to take a look at how race impacts life within this country. And recently, this concept um, has come under fire. It has become the wedge issue of American politics right now. Um, all of your quote unquote conservative Republican politicians are blasting it in their speeches. And then more importantly to this conversation, a lot of your conservative Christian churches are doing the same thing and not just Christian churches, but also seminaries. Myron mentioned earlier that a, a group of seminaries put together a statement condemning critical race theory and saying that it could not be taught. Uh, and then we have um, different uh, states that are putting in legislation that critical race theory can't be taught in schools which is interesting because critical race theory was never taught in schools. <laughs> so you're creating legislation for something that was never really an issue in the first place because no school board has implemented critical race theory into their curriculum. It is a, it is a study or a theory that is studied at the graduate level in college in legal courses, but the attack, to critical race theory is not the place where it's actually taught, but it's being attacked at the grade school level where it's not actually taught. Uh, so that is what is happening right now. Someone asked, is critical race theory just about race? It's important to understand that the, the, the term critical race theory was uh, coined or curated by Kimberly Crenshaw who is the same uh, legal expert scholar who also coined the term intersectionality, which points out that a lot of times there are people in this country who have two different forms or two different identities within one person that intersect in the ways that they are oppressed. So it's one thing to be oppressed as a woman in a patriarchal society. It's another thing to be oppressed as a black woman in a patriarchal white supremacist society. So you have these two forms of oppression that intersect. So critical race theory also talks a little bit about that and it has been blasted by a lot of people. So I wanna start here and I wanna start with Karima the truth. Let's go ahead and just lay it on us Karima. Karima, what, why do you think some people are so opposed to critical race theory? Hmm. I've been asking myself this question for the last couple of weeks. And whenever there is a big hoorah like this, I always run to the people who are stoking the fire or, or who are opposed to it. And the only thing that I can come up with is that there needs to be a limitation to truth because let's just follow, let's just follow the line of thinking. What happens when you expose children, the next generation, to this way of thinking. What happens? What could happen is that they begin to question everything that they were taught before, and they begin to pull upon this little thread that we call the current reality. And when children in the K through 12 space, especially children who are right now, right, this generation, that number one, the internet, they were born into the internet. They don't know a time where the internet doesn't exist. So they already understand mobilization. They already understand globalization, right? That's just their world. 
Secondly, you also put in there what's happening in the economy. You throw in the fact that now the economy is switching into this, this new cryptocurrency type of world that really has the capability of leveling the playing field. And so now if you were to take a group of people and if they were to be indoctrinated, because that's all this school does is it indoctrinates you into whatever it is that that school's ideology is. So indoctrination is the training of someone, right? Their mindset, right? So that it becomes your worldview. So if you take a group of individuals and you train their thinking into thinking that the current structure of their whole existence has been built upon this falsehood and that they can do something about it. And then you throw in what is happening in the world of economy as far as the changes that are happening and, and how we now, as to what Myron said, can really talk about equity in the financial sphere because you know cryptocurrency doesn't understand if you're black or white. It's about you know the, the digits. There is no it's very hard to be biased in that world. Now you have an opportunity to have a group of individuals that can change the conversation. And those who don't want their lifestyle to be changed, that scares them. I was reading in social media, a group of um, white folks, and they were talking about CRT. And this one woman said, you know, I'm not afraid of someone coming and taking away my stuff yet. And I said, oh, 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 your slip is showing. That's what it is. That's really what it is. So that's, that's what I see is at the heart of it. Because something happens when you take children, children who are open-minded, who are ready to, to adapt whatever you put in front of them. And if you were to imagine a generation and they were able to understand, oh, this is why it is number one, and I am born with the tools in front of me in order to spread what I perceive as truth, number two, and number three, I now have tools in my hand that I can literally and actually do something about it. Oh, that's a dangerous thing. Yes, 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 that's very dangerous. But I think it's important that we understand who that's dangerous for. It's dangerous for people in power, for people who enjoy the system functioning that the way that it currently functions. I, I appreciate you bringing that up. I also want to uh, bring up Grayson the Pundit is with us today in the virtual audience. He's not on the cast, but he, he raised the question while I was explaining CRT. He said, is it that racism impacts life in this country or that racism is life? in this country that's a that's a great question he also just said at the core of white identity is the understanding that whatever has been stolen can just as easily been taken back and you know what grayson i almost i almost push back against that because white identity doesn't acknowledge that anything is stolen yeah White identity suggests that everything is earned. Merit, meritocracy. So where, which that therein lies the problem. We can't even agree on a starting point for this conversation. We can't even agree that racism is systemic. How are we going to talk about critical race theory when we can't even talk about the fact that we can't even agree that racism is systemic? How are we going to talk about, um, you know, what has been stolen when the people whose ancestors stole it don't even acknowledge that it was stolen just oh god myron what you think man why do people hate crt so much well you took the words right out of my mouth uh because of that myth of meritocracy right everybody thinks that they got there on their own and they pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps uh when in actuality that is not a lie that is a lie, rather. You have been aided by the system by which you participate in. And some people have been aided more than others. Uh, and so the fear is that you are attacking the idea of meritocracy, that I made this, I did this. Uh, and so we can't talk about 
balancing the scales. And I want to keep using that language. We can't talk about balancing the scales because you're going to take something from me and give it to somebody else. Uh, and I earn this. Uh, and the truth of the matter is you didn't earn this. Uh, somebody helped you get there. Um, you know, we were talking about wealth a little bit earlier. Uh, it's easy for somebody to have a huge net worth if you had a 250 year head start of gaining wealth. Right. If you've only had 50 years to accumulate wealth, you're not going to have as much as somebody who has had 200, 350 years of an opportunity to gain wealth and then had 300 years of free labor to do it. Uh, so it's the myth of meritocracy. I, I keep thinking about uh, and I don't know how this relates, but I'm going to just throw it in there. Uh, I keep thinking about that debate. I think it was in in the early 2000s, that Supreme Court debate where they were talking about race. And the chief justice said, you know, the way to stop discriminating, discriminating on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. And RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I should pour some out for the dead homie. God bless your RBG. She responded to the <laughs> chief justice. She responded and said, you know, how are you going to achieve a racial objective if you don't have a racial means to get there? Uh, so sometimes we've got to talk about the elephant in the room and realize that race has been critical in helping people achieve. So sometimes we've got to institute racial means to help the people who have been uh, oppressed achieve. Yes, sir. And right now we're going to pray for Myron's safety as obviously someone is shooting in the background. Yeah, you hear that? They've got a gun range back here. I live in the country. Uh, in the in the I, I, I was gonna say an epithet right there, uh, and they put a uh, they put a gun range right here in the backyard, and so they just <laughs> they just shooting away <laughs> at eight wild. o'clock at night. <laughs> I'm like, who is busting caps? I'm like, in the neighborhood. I'm, and the funny part is, you can't shoot at noon. You want to shoot at night? Really, guys? <laughs> <laughs> Myself. Let them know, Randall. Let them know. <laughs> oh man, yes. Everything you said. Everything you said. Nikki, what are your thoughts? Oh, I mean, I agree with everything that's been said, and I and I think what I was thinking is just saying it another way. I th- I think the reason pe- people don't want to talk about this or learn it or study it is because it exposes the lie that everybody in this country is equal. Um, it, it exposes this lie that we, that the majority or those in power pacify themselves with. And I think, Christian, I, I, I exactly understand where you're coming from when you say we can't even agree where to start on this conversation. I think, though, that their pushback, on, that people's pushback on teaching critical race theory uh, is exposes that they know that that's where it's that that's the starting place that we have to understand that this that racism in our country is systemic um, and that that it's built into our laws and our processes and the ways that we do business um, and that it, it's it's a part of the ethos <laughs> I said that earlier using it again to 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 um, reemphasize it. Yes, you're um, good now. Ethos ethos of our country. Um, And and it's it's just a part of everyday life. And so if we let people study that, then all of a sudden their eyes will be open and they will see. Absolutely, Nikki. And again, we need more people like you because I believe that whenever it comes to an, uh, uh, the topic of oppression, you need people in the privileged community to acknowledge their privilege and want to leverage it for good. So I appreciate your willingness to leverage that even in conversation. And I know you go beyond that. You're raising two beautiful children and you're raising them to be people who care about humanity, not just the people that look like them. You're raising them to be people who who understand that race is a social construct, but that construct is real in how it functions in our society. So we need more people like you um, to to make those statements and 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 say and say the stuff that you're saying right now. So I, I really appreciate that. And, and that's the point 
of this whole conversation like we can't agree on a starting point in my preparation for tonight's show i did a lot of research i read i watched videos and i always watch and read up on the opposing argument because when i first heard about critical race theory i was like yeah you know makes sense and then i heard the opposition to it and i was like whoa people are really upset about this let me see what they're saying let me see what the issue is and what i found is that you have these personalities who have large followings who simply tell their crowd what they want to hear and they'll make statements in such a matter of fact nonchalant way like you know i heard one personality say uh yeah you know people are actually saying that racism happens every day and that was the point of his statement like to his audience everybody was like yeah that's crazy right because they don't even want to deal with the fact <laughs> that racism occurs in this country every single day so we can't even agree on where to start because if we agree on a starting point like nikki just mentioned and like karima always says it starts to pull that string that unravels everything if we get down to the core of it everything tied to the core is going to crumble which is why people are so concerned that if critical race theory actually takes a hold and we actually start looking at race critically then our way of life is going to be destroyed our country is going to be destroyed and the the way that we do ministry and the teaching of Jesus is not aligned with all of this, which I just, you know, to be perfectly honest, and Nikki gave me permission to do this, is a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> bullshit. I think, I think it's, it's a bullshit. bunch of, yeah. Because every argument that I've seen against critical race theory is not based in any type of historical research whatsoever. I've watched all these videos of people talking about why critical race theory is bad, and they spend the first 10 minutes of their of their commentary just saying random convoluted nonsensical bullshit. like when are you going to say something of substance like can you get to the point it's like you know our children and they're going to ruin our children and we just need to talk about sin because sin is the real problem we don't need to talk about all of this stuff and it's just like man y'all so Full of shit, Myron. Go ahead. Jump in there and say that racism is sin. Uh, so we should talk about racism in, in theological circles. There is a theological term, a uh, phrase that says that sin is radical. Uh, and the idea of radical doesn't mean outrageous. It's a theological term there, and it means to the root. Uh, and what you'll discover that racism is also radical. That it goes down to the root of American culture. Uh, so really, it is synonymous with sin. So if you want to talk about sin and its radical nature, you've got to talk about racism and its radical nature that it goes down to the core. And maybe, maybe we should dissect it to the core so that we can plant a new tree. Yeah, man, absolutely. Grayson posted it uh, on social media, like either last week or the week before, something to the effect that if your Christianity uh, is is not strong enough to address the topic of racism, then maybe your Christianity is rooted in white supremacy. And Christian cancel culture, in many ways, is pushing back against critical race theory because in many predominantly white conservative Christian spaces, they worship at the altar of white supremacy they worship at the altar of white jesus which is the most sanitized bastardized version of jesus i have ever seen in my life let me stop because i see kareem with the the shoulders going she laughing at me kareem don't do that like i listen okay let me stop but i told you come on you, have to move today. you better let it rip 
You better come on and tell the truth. Let me <laughs> I told y'all. I've been I've been in this thing like real heavy. And Grayson just mentioned I'm quoting Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis. That's where he pulled that thought from. So shout out to Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis. So he, here's where I want to go with this. Believe it or not, <laughs> we got 12 more minutes for the official episode. <laughs> and then we'll continue the rest after this with the live virtual audience. I keep telling y'all, y'all got to join us on Patreon so you can get all of the content. So when I when I do this type of research on these topics, I always look at the opposing argument because I want to know what exactly is the opposing argument. Not so I can learn how to argue against it, but I want to see if there's something I'm missing. I genuinely look at the opposing argument because I think to myself, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe there's something in the tenets of this particular concept that I've overlooked. And when I when I looked at the opposing arguments, it did nothing but piss me off because nobody wants to deal with the reality of history. The people who are arguing against critical race theory are literally arguing against history. They're arguing against the facts of our history. So let's look at some of these arguments. We may only have time to do one for the official episode and we can deal with the rest in the after party. So one argument against CRT is that it creates division among the races. Karina, what do you say to that? Horse shit. That's what that is. That's horse shit. So, okay, it creates division among the races. And this goes back to the question that you asked at the top of the conversation. I remember sitting in my predominantly white Christian high school, and I remember experiencing the division. I am the division. It's already here. And by not acknowledging my existence and not acknowledging the history of, of people like me who got here, you were just you were you were just trying to overlook what already exists. And so how can we say that it creates something? Oh, or, or, and it goes to what you said, it creates division for those that have never experienced it before. Is that what it is? So I, I, I'm Christian, I'm like you, I am completely flabbergasted by this idea. I, I'm like you, I like to dig, I like to sit with both sides. I, I teach my children, you learn to argue the other side, argue for the other side. So that in doing so, now you thoroughly understand where they're coming from. I can't, I, I cannot make heads or tails. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm really, no, seriously. I really want someone to help me understand. Like, are you really saying that this is revisionist history? Because now we're telling the whole story? I Seriously, y'all, I'm, I'm, for real, I'm, I'm about two steps from saying, you know what? Y'all can go ahead. Y'all can go ahead and have it. Go ahead. I'm just yeah. going over here because that's what a lot of black folks are saying. They're like, you know what? Here's my purse. We out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. all right, then I'm gonna head on out then. All right. You know, that's 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 really where I'm at with it because I really just can't understand. No, for real. I really I'm asking you. What are they really saying is divisive? And I get the whole thing that you know there'll be some children, some white children that may feel bad. Is that really it? Is there anything deeper than that? No, I'm, I, I'm lost. I'm honestly, I'm honestly lost. It looked like Myron had his hand up, like he wanted to say me. something. Help me understand. I, I'm just shocked that something in the '70s created division, like division didn't already exist. Listen, right, like it, we weren't divided before critical race theory. <laughs> this is what created the division. Oh, OK. Listen, I'm like, this is just some white shit that I just ain't going to understand. You know, there's some things that I'm just not going to understand. And this might just be one of them because I really cannot wrap my head around it. And and I'm serious when I'm like, you know what? Y'all can go ahead. on. I'm done. Did I ever, did I ever tell you about that time? I, I may have told the story before that I went with a friend to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and the lady in Alcoholics Anonymous said something that sticks to my core. Uh, and I, I will never forget it. She told that group, she said, you're only as sick as your secret. Uh, in America, you are sick because you've got a secret. 
and CRT is just exposing the secret that you've already had. It's been the elephant in the room. We know it's there. And it's about time that we just pull the bandaid off and say, here is the problem so that we can heal it. We can reveal and then heal. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So, Nikki, I'd love to hear from you because this whole argument that it creates division amongst the races and the argument is constantly, well, what are we telling our kids? And you, as a white woman who is raising two white children, mm -hmm. what does that mean to you? So I called my children today and I asked them, I said, I'm going to ask you all a question. I'll explain after I ask it why I'm asking you, but I just want to ask you a question because they know that like they have talks with mom and it's about things like misogyny and patriarchy and racism and all of that stuff. And they just learned they have to sit and talk with me about those things. And so I, I asked them, I said, when we talk about white supremacy and the way that racism has harmed minorities in our country and the ways that we are privileged as, um, as white people, I said, do you feel guilty when I talk to you about that? They looked at me like I was crazy. They were like, no. And, um, and so I told them, I said, you know, there are people who are saying that it would, it would make children like you feel guilty. And as we kept talking, essentially, they understand that they aren't responsible for creating America this way, but that they have power to impact America positively and make a change. And there, so, so I don't think teaching critical race theory is going to create division at all. My children, I mean, hate, hate is taught, racism is taught. My children have friends of all colors, all religions. Like it, and, and it's so, it's so much more um, fluid than it was in my day, like they, the, who they mix with and who they talk to and, and who they're friends with and come from all kinds of different backgrounds. And so I think that honestly, um, when we teach something like critical race theory, when we help our children see this, it will begin to heal the division that is already there because those children who are born into privilege can understand that, that they can use that privilege in lots of ways. And we can teach them how to use it in ways that share the privilege and move the privilege and, and, and make it more equal. I think it'll heal division. Yes. Okay, I got a helicopter. No, that's... And I see it exactly how you say it. And I want to add to that because I do believe that it will help to heal a lot of division for those who are unaware of the division that currently exists and are open to learning more about the lived experiences of others. But for the people who are committed to their ignorance or committed to the lie, yes, critical race theory will only exacerbate the division that currently exists. But that's rooted in the person who is actually engaging the concept it's like, what is your openness to the concept? Because, you know, Austin Taylor is with us in the virtual audience. He said there was a there was a school board meeting in his county yesterday where people got arrested and it was around the topic of critical race theory. Like, yeah, there are some people who are so committed to the lie that, yeah, it's only going to deepen the division because they're not going to let go of the lie. And if you're committed to the lie, the truth will cause division. So the question isn't, should we talk about the truth? The question is, when are you going to give up the fucking lie? Yes. All right, let me stop. Right. Dang. Dang. Oh, oh. <laughs> Come on with it. Dang. Double air horns. 
I'm trying. I'm trying to keep my cool. It's just. It's so frustrating. It's infuriating. It really, really, like it. It. It pains me to my soul, to my core, to to think about this. It's exhausting. Is what I. Think. And and the and the the challenge. You're right, Nick, uh, Karima. It's exhausting, and the challenge is how do we address this without going numb? Because the cha- the challenge for me is how do I keep from going numb? Because that's that's the direction I feel myself leaning in at times. Anybody want to share anything else before we wrap this up and go into the after party? <laughs> All right, so we got a couple of things we're going to discuss in the after party because there are two more arguments that I think we need to address. So for those of you who are listening and uh, aren't a part of the Patreon community, if you join the Patreon community, here's what you're going to hear. So some say that CRT is a distraction from the teachings of Jesus. I'd like to know what the cast has to say about that. And there are some that say the major fault in CRT, because we're talking about Christian cancel culture, the major fault in CRT is it suggests Christianity plays a major role in racial oppression. So they're saying that CRT is wrong because it suggests Christianity plays a major role in racial oppression. And I want to know what the cast has to say about that. So that's what we're going to cover in the after party. Next time when we come back, we're going to discuss Christian cancel culture and how it's applied to rituals. I know Tyranny AT&T Jordan is excited about that one because we had to keep her from talking about rituals in the last episode because she was ready. So we're going to talk about that one next time. This has been Holy Smokes, Cigars and Spirituality. Thank you all so much for joining us. Come over to Patreon and hang out with us. Y'all have a great day.